Excuse me. All right. We are just letting people pile in. I'm like constantly refreshing our people tab, so I'm seeing people join. Everybody out there can hear us. Uh, please, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, go ahead and say hello in the chat. Um, you can use the, the session chat or, or any part of that and say hello and let us know where you're at and hopefully confirm that you actually can hear us. <laughs> There's Ray. Hello. <clears throat> what's on Frank's shirt? I missed it. Frank, what's on your shirt? And you're muted. He's on mute. Oh, it depends. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I was on mute there. This is also um, classic Marketo purple. I was able to find it in, so... Mm, there you go. Um, Chili Piper swag here. <laughs> <laughs> Repping the CP. I love it. Um, to kick things off, since uh, since we can get going in just a minute here, I'm going to go ahead and open a poll for all of you attendees uh, that asks a pretty simple question about what lead routing tool you're actually using today. Um, and then let's watch some of those results pile in. Um, it'll be interesting, maybe for frame of reference for us as we go through um, where we can lean in a little bit more. I expect to see some Chili Piper, obviously, because we have some support from Chili Piper as uh, the sponsor of this activity today, and we appreciate them. Thank you very much. This is also in conjunction with their, um, the co, the, excuse me, the research that we're doing alongside Chili Piper. Um, around lead routing and lead management. And so if you haven't taken the CRM routing survey yet, we did send an email out about that today. Uh, and all of that information, of course, is aggregated and anonymized, just like our State of the MoPro research. And so we'd love to provide value back to the community. And so if you haven't taken it yet, please keep an eye out for that research and um, let's all get better and learn from each other. Um, but okay, so we've got Chili Piper and Lean Data. Gosh, no ring leads. That Salesforce lead assignment, which I feel bad for. <laughs> is that you, Frank? Did you <laughs> did you answer that one? I would never admit I was using <laughs> that, even if I even if I was. <laughs> so funny. Um, and so, for those of you that haven't taken the survey, if you click the Docs tab in the right hand corner, you can click the See How You Stack Up uh, link, and and that'll take you out to that survey, and you can help us all get better together. So I'm going to stop sharing the survey uh, about lead routing. But we're going to get into things. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Mike Rizzo. I am the founder of the MoPros community. And if you can't tell, uh, I am a little bit head cold sick today. So I'm a little uh, less energetic than I hopefully normally am. Um, and, and so hopefully the crew here will, will drive us through. But I think that there's a lot to learn around this topic of, uh, and a lot to discuss around the topic of lead routing and, and from different perspectives. And so what I wanna do right now is just go around and have the crew here introduce themselves. Um, and then we're gonna jump into some, some questions that we had that were pulled right out of the conversations in the community. And I think that we'll kind of see where it goes from there. But um, uh, just talking to this group, it's, I, I already know it's going to be super valuable for all of you. So I'm excited. So uh, let's start with you, Frank. Um, maybe tell us a little about yourself and then you can popcorn uh, across the board and, and we'll get it all okay. going. Well, uh, Frank Ely, um, have been a marketing ops nerd since you know, circa 2005 um, with uh, Salesforce and Marketo. Uh, most of my career has been with startups, but um, you know, just more recently, last couple of years, working for a global enterprise. And uh, surprisingly, the approach to lead routing across those startups and even the large enterprise has been largely the same, but uh, have stubbed my toes plenty of times and have some, some things to share. Awesome. Um, who's next? How about uh, Kimberly? Why don't we go with you? Hi, everyone. I'm Kimberly Gallitz. I work in marketing operations as well. Um, been doing it for, I don't even know. I, don't, I stopped counting years when I got old, so I was like, forget it. But um, lead routing is one of my favorite topics, weirdly enough, because I love the collaboration between sales and marketing and how crucial it is, which we'll talk about. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me, Mike. 
Yeah, I'm glad you're here. My phone was about to start ringing in everybody's ear. Um, Tyler, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm Tyler Moore. I'm a product manager at SwagUp, kind of focused on the growth side of things. Um, a little bit new to the game, but excited to bring a different perspective. I'm happy to be cool. here. Thanks. Thanks for being here, Tyler. I have to admit, when I when I saw you called out as uh, somebody who could could jump in, and then we got to talking, I was like, okay, yeah, this is actually really interesting because you have a unique title. So uh, I'm excited to learn from you. And Scott, um, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm Scott. Uh, so I head up RevOps over at Chili Piper. Um, just got good. I'd say a good bit of experience with lead routing under my belt from experience and as an end user, just kind of like the good and the bad. And then also managing it over here at Chili Piper, a lot of the different learns we've done from being really small to where we are today with a whole bunch of reps. So looking forward to chatting about it. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. So um, let's go ahead and, and jump in. Um, the very first sort of question we wanted or just category and, and, and intro into this whole thing. I think, Frank, you and I, when we all met with the group, we started talking about you know, kind of the foundations of where most of us start, or at least a lot of us ended up starting uh, back in the day with Salesforce and their lead assignment and their flow builder. And I, you know, we want to talk a little about a little bit about what's missing from the, you know, the ecosystem that is the Salesforce lead assignment flow builder, and then maybe what else might be missing from some other products. But I'd love to start like with a little bit of your experience, Frank, and sure. Uh, and we'll kind of go from there. Sure. And, you know, and I did wear my it depends. You know, uh, every answer will start with it depends. So I'll just ch start jumping over that. But, uh, yeah, I th you know, one of your original questions was who owns, you know, lead routing? You know, is it, who is it sales ops, is it marketing ops? And, you know, the, the obvious answer is the policy is always owned by sales operations, right? They're, they're the ones who determine, you know, where the leads go. But, in terms of the mechanics, you know, with my experience at say being employee 16 at one startup and employee 30 at another startup, it was years before anybody who was hired full time to take care of Salesforce at all. So frequently the marketing team had the most invested in the in being able to make sure the leads from the website got somewhere. They were the ones handling the leads in the first place. So, you know, around the table with just a few assets, you know, they were we were frequently the ones raising our hands saying, yeah, we can do that. But, um, you know, to give you an idea of circa 2005, you know, I can do a quick screen share here. We are talking about Salesforce. Let's make sure I've got the right screen. So this is a screenshot. Are you seeing this? Yeah. Uh, this, I took this screenshot this morning. This is an old um, development system that we're no longer using at my current company. But this is the same interface that I encountered in 2005 in Salesforce. And just to give you a, a quick idea of, you know, the, the limitations, you know, if you're using Trello or Miro and you can grab a card and you can so elegantly move it here and there and the screen follows you and you drop it in place. You know, here, if you wanted to reorder these, you would have to go set the numbers again and then hit the reorder button. Uh, if you were to dive into one of these things, um, you know, there there is some, uh, you know, field assignments, you can look at um, a particular field and if it does, it contains or is match, then you can say, okay, that has a match, we will assign it to so-and-so. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, uh, the, the thing is, if you decided that there needed to be another uh, rule above this first one, you just have to change them. You couldn't slide them up and down or anything like that. So it's a very kludgy interface. A lot of us in, you know, uh, will um, stop share here. We'll, you know, try to pass by that as quickly as possible. So that's where you start looking. But, you know, again, in many cases, uh, you know, in your early days, you know, even the last startup, I was like employee number 30. Sure, there was a person who was titled with sales ops, but the quality problem that he was working on is he spent 85% of his day doing uh, contract red lines for account execs. Mm. Best use of that person's time. And he really wasn't a salesperson, Salesforce, you know, um, guru. So, you know, I happened to know it. I took it over and it was all working in Marketo. So the answer is always, you know, who has the best tools? Mm. And, you know, later mm -hmm. on, we can talk about that point where uh, it stops making sense 
to use Salesforce. It stops making sense to even use Marketo. It starts making sense to use some of these other tools that we were talking about a little later. But, you know, for mm -hmm. right now, that is often, I think of it as a maturity curve as much as just a, a technical challenge. You know, there's a point where it stops making technical sense and it starts making business sense to, mm -hmm. to shift it from the mechanics from, uh, from marketing to sales. Yeah, I think, you know, all of us can appreciate a, a more attractive user experience and interface <laughs> that's that's more intuitive than, um, you know, having to manually type in numbers and, you know, create the feeling of lead routing, not the yeah. not the plugging in buttons type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tyler, I think, you know, what, what were you guys doing before you, uh, I think you're a user of Chili Piper based on the swag, <laughs> um, but tell us a little bit about what you guys were doing and what was painful and, and all of that. Yeah, I think to Frank's point, we stayed in Salesforce for too long. So when we wanted to add multiple different queues and start really expanding logic to route based on uh, intent signals and things like that, we stayed in Salesforce and ended up developing some custom code in there built on top of the uh, out of the box solution. And that, as we grew rapidly, like became really difficult to maintain. There are developers on my team that were our in-house Salesforce gurus that were spending a lot of time making those changes. And then also they're working on a bunch of other things. So those changes ended up happening really slowly. It was slowing down the team. And like as people were joining in and we wanted to add new logic, it took a long time. It was expensive because it required development time. And it was also ended up being expensive to maintain. And... I think that's where our frustration came was we we're spending a lot of time maintaining something that's like not the bread and butter of our business so that that was probably the biggest pain point for me as a as a product manager like wanting to focus on our platform and not uh having developers working on something that uh is related to to lead routing so mm -hmm. yeah i think we kind of stuck in that salesforce thing for a little bit too long yeah, but it's hard to know what time it is right when you're mature enough to leave yeah, so that's so interesting. I think that question we're definitely going to dive into in a moment. Um, and it seems like there's a trend, right? Like it, it's either somebody was given the keys to try to own this thing, but they're not technical enough. And then Tyler, you're saying, hey, we've got the technical chops to do it, but it's not what we should be doing. <laughs> and so we need we need like there's there's different types of signals that that a marketing ops or rev ops team can can pick up on to make a decision on when is it time to start moving forward. And Kimberly, I think you were saying um, that you, you, you uh, excuse me, you had a Salesforce admin that was owning, um, you know, the, the interface, but that created problems, right? Like it was, it was slow to work with them. Yeah. Similar to what Tyler was saying. I mean, your Salesforce admin is usually responsible for everything the business touches. So it's it's outside of marketing, it's outside of sales. It even has to do with contracts and renewals and things that go beyond what you're working on. So their time was really divided, which is fair. And we were growing really fast. And we were seeing like a six week lead time on updating round robin pools, which, you know, as a business grows that fast, you're getting new BDRs every Monday. So a six week lead time to update uh, round robin pool and Salesforce was just not something that made sense to the business. And, it, you know, our, we had one Salesforce admin uh, under a lot of stress. So it became very evident very quickly that that tool wasn't going to be for us anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's let's dive in a little bit about partnership. Um, you know, in our MoPros community, we, you know, we sort of asked this question about lead routing, right? And then there was a wonderful conversation and a thread that happened. And Everyone really rallied around the idea that sales ops should be owning lead route routing, but the caveat was that marketing ops should absolutely be a partner in all of that. Um, so I'd love to to hear from each one of you about your partnership with sales ops um, and how you're establishing like a quality lead routing practice. Um, and so, you know, Kimberly, I'd love for you to jump in and then whoever else wants to go after that would be great. Yeah. So um, lucky enough to have, used lean data at two companies now. And um, at my, my previous company, I was the owner in MOPS because I owned the, the tech, the tool. I was trained on the tool and we didn't have a, a big sales ops team. So at the time, it, it really made sense for marketing to own the tool with 
a very close partnership with sales, obviously, because marketing had their own rules for certain types of leads. So event leads was a really good example. Um, we had an agreement, again, between the events team and marketing and the sales team. We had certain reps that worked trade shows. So those leads had to be routed in a specific way, in a specific time, you know, to specific account reps. And so that was very, very locked down. So we owned all that. And then I worked every day to come up with the exact path. And we put it in a Word doc to start before we even plugged it into Lean Data and just said, what happens when this happens? What happens when this happens? And we just went line by line through every scenario. Uh, it was me and the sales ops girl. And we just, you know, days in a room just knocking it out. And I think that was so key because she could communicate to her stakeholders that our partnership was really strong and she had all the input in the world. And I could communicate back to my stakeholders. Yep, we got events locked down. Sales told us what to do with these. And that that just made it so much easier when people questioned anything. Like, nope, we've thought through this. This is our partnership. You know, sales didn't question it because my my pal in sales was involved and marketing didn't question it because I was involved from that end. So it was a really great partnership. And I think that made us successful overall. So that's been really great. And now I actually don't own it, but I work directly with our sales ops. So it's it's just flip-flopped and it's just as great. So I love that. Nice. At what point did that transition happen where like they you decided that they should own more of that tool and tooling and process? Uh well for it like it's just because I switched companies and so now I'm I'm on the other wow. side and I uh sales ops own it owns it at this company, whereas my previous company marketing ops owned it. And I think at that point it was resources. It was, um, like I said, they, they didn't really have sales ops yet. So because we had mm. marketing ops, it was like, okay, well, we'll, we'll own it for now. And then um, as more sales ops came on board, I think that their partnership's a little bit stronger now and more people are involved in the training of the tool and getting ramped up, but it, it takes a little bit. So I was the only one trained. So it was me. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. So switching yeah. roles and resources uh, yep. play a big factor in that case. Got it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maturity and and Frank, I think, you know, this is a good place for you to jump in on the maturity curve stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, 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 like Kimberly, um, you know, marketing ops, we've, you know, owned it traditionally for quite a long time. Um, the, as long as, it's based on easy to articulate and document strategies like that. Like we only have one product and all of the sales reps are positioned geographically. Then, you know, if it's an EMEA, it goes here. If it's an APAC, it goes there. Very straightforward. Yeah, fine. Can handle that. Start adding more territories underneath those. Gets more granular. Yeah, we can still handle that. You know, it's, it's pretty easy logic flow. And I'd rather do that in Marketo smart list than try and do that in that Salesforce, you know, interface. Um, two products, right? Um, as long as they're still going geographically, okay, product one has this set of geographies that it covers. Product two has that set of geographies that it covers. You're kind of splitting out your smart campaigns to, to accommodate those flows. But then somebody comes to you and says, you know, Frank, uh, everybody can sell anything now. But you know what we really need to do? We need to start sending those leads to the three teams that we're going to create, enterprise, mid-market, and small business, right? And then you, you know, you don't say no because you're you're a good team player, but you say, you know, in order to do that effectively, let's let's kind of think about what you're asking. Isn't revenue and employee size the way you've defined these market uh, you know, swim lanes? That's really an account attribute. It's really not a, a lead attribute anymore, is it? So we need to make sure that your sales force has good account data and we made and then we probably need a tool once that lead hits salesforce to map it to the right account to know what type of account it is to send it over and this discussion happens time and time again as you start to get into abm or target accounts for example so it's at that moment where the intelligence absolutely lies in your crm in, in my case salesforce where you begin to say you know, it's it's gone beyond what I should rationally be doing with Marketo. You know, my even my enrichments, you know, I'm, I'm using Clearbit and you're using DNB, right? So we're never going to agree on, you know, in many cases, you know, what's what what swim lanes are going to. And it becomes embedded with you know, compensation levels. Like if you send something to mid-market, 
and they work on it for two weeks and then enterprise takes it away from them, you've just made an enemy, right? Or the other way around, you know, you send it to mid-market and they actually land the deal and, it, and enterprise doesn't get their taste. You just don't want to be <laughs> making that many enemies of the, of the rest of the org, right? So again, it's a sales ops thing now. It's, it's bound up with company strategy, sales strategy, and compensation. And we can help with the mechanics. You know, there, there's still a collaboration that happens with, with sales. So you clearly identify what it was when it came in, what the data is that's available for the lead. But at that point, the mechanics are really in sales hands. That makes sense. I think, you know, um, the partnership of making sure that the lead can get routed from all of the inputs that the marketing ops team can support, right? Like the enrichment process and the capturing of the information, all that stuff can be owned, but the whole don't get in the way of comp like I, I love that you called out the compensation piece, um, both here and and when we talked previously, because it's something that slips my mind frequently as a marketing ops person is like, oh yeah, there's like these comp, you know, things that happen over on the sales side, and we need to be cognizant of not in getting in, of not interfering with anything there, uh, and just being a partner, right? Because you don't want to make enemies, like you said. <laughs> um. Anybody else, anything to share or thoughts about ownership or partnership around sales and marketing? Yeah, I mean, I can speak a little bit to it. Um, it's like for us, for example, um, so we don't, we don't yet have marketing ops hiring for it, but <laughs> it's mostly comprised of about like at this point in the stage where we are, we've got about 240 or so employees, I think. Um, so we've got about I'd say like three or so people that are typically involved in just the different handoff points, um, which I'd say, again, involves marketing, involves sales ops. And we also have it for also the post-sales motion for handoff to like the CS and account management team. Mm. Um, I think sort of like what Kimberly highlighted, like one of the biggest things is making sure you document it and just like specifically define like here's all these scenarios that happen. And this is why it should go to like this team versus another team because um, otherwise if you don't have something to reference you can't really <laughs> improve on it or see why something's not really working too well mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so like a, another like thing that we we do we just have like a consistent weekly uh, like meeting like sp specifically with sales team just to gather like more feedback on that so we know like marketing and sales are in alignment with like who should be receiving meetings uh, just like making sure we're updating people who either like transition roles or like come into the company and so on. Um, that way you just like establish some type of cadence for review on top of like the documentation that you're looking at. I think that's so critical to that, you know, continued alignment across the org, right? Is, is if you build SLAs and you have these agreements in place, so you need to have a regular uh, cadence of meetings. I, how often are you meeting? You said weekly or monthly, sorry. Yeah, we've been doing weekly, like we. There's other talks that we cover in this, like sales weekly, of course. But mm -hmm. we just have the team members that are involved, like an operational aspect in that call, like just as we're like con continuing to test out different things. Mm -hmm. uh, like some recent stuff we've been doing is like account assignment through like intent signals, um, but just to gather like feedback at the you're Like, no, this is horrible. You, we need to like refine it and not send as much, you know, over the gate. Right. Yeah, like to basically just like kind of distract them from their day to day work. So that way it's more, I'd say, like a little bit more focused on their efforts. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the point about documentation is key, like looking for those outlier like scenarios, you know, it, just having something to fall back on is is tremendously important. And then you can literally show somebody what it is that you you established an agreement on. Um, I think that, you know, shameless plug for the eventual certification of a marketing operations professional that we as a community will build together. But I think that's one of those elements, right? We, we have something that people sign off on, literally sign off on, um, to show that you're doing the hard work to understand how things should be working and establishing those agreements. And, and so that stuff really, really important. Um, and I know as a, as a group, we were all talking about, um, you know, maybe showing off a little bit of sort of the, the, the how the cookie's made, as I like to say, 
um, around what you're doing within your orgs. And if there's anything that you could screen share or just a, an image that you could share around your flow and your process um, and talk us through a little bit about maybe the journey of getting there, um, that'd be that'd be super helpful. Um, I don't know who wants to jump in first, though. <laughs> so I'll let whoever wants to go first. Oh, Scott's muted. Yeah, muted, yeah. I was saying I don't mind. I can hop in and just kind of give you look at what we've got. Um, do you want me to just kind of show from more so like top of the funnel to like different handoff points or? Yeah, yeah. If you've got, I mean, as long as it's not going to give away any super secret anything to, <laughs> the, to the world, then we'd love yeah. to see a little bit about like how your lead routing process works and and what you're doing and what you're thinking about. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to hop in and I can share my screen. Wait, that turned off the video. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll probably hop in like our marketing workspace just to kind of connect the dots with like our more of the CRM routing component that we've got. But um, we've got like a bunch of different workspaces in here. So just like disregard, like there's a lot of stuff going on. But essentially at the end of the day, if somebody goes like, let's say they go to our website, like chilipiper.com. And then they want to request a demo or like, obviously there's other ways they're going to get into our systems. So mm -hmm. we use HubSpot for market automation. So we've got the forms here. You've got, um, to info form complete sitting behind here, just doing like enrichment to kind of minimize the fields that are going on there. Um, based on what they select here for what territory essentially they're sitting in for the region and in the CRM, um, and then there's also like a company size field on the back end. It, it'll either enrich or it won't, and you'll have to select it. Mm -hmm. um, based on those rules matching right here, we just have different teams split up um, for region and sort of like what Frank mentioned, uh, like we're at the point where we have SMB and market enterprise. Um, and the two main regions we focus on is like North America and ABA. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, like we've got all these different rules. You can see they're pretty long. <laughs> they don't oh, have wow, yeah. Complicated, but um, essentially, like what we're doing is we've got a group of reps right here, and then we have rules here that determine who it goes to. So, um, also to like filter out records that we don't want to see come in to the sales team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the way like we have ours built, like obviously we're using our own tool. So this is our main router on the website. So if somebody comes inbound, essentially like we're first looking to see, hey, are they, are, like, are they a customer? And then we're going to toss that to the account manager that's assigned on the account. So that's just looking at a look at value on the account. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's like a name account. So if they own it, it's going to toss to that owner. Um, otherwise, if it doesn't meet that ownership, it's going to basically look here at the rules um, that sort of like I described a minute earlier, where we're just saying like, in this case, if it's maybe North American, it fits that company size, it'll get tossed to that group of reps. Um, now that's just from like the inbound side of it. And then if like if they don't book, the same thing happens where it flows through that set of rules and then they get alerted, they can follow up. Um, now for the cases where if they don't book and so on, like this is where we've got the other component that we've been working on um, with district, where essentially you have the same kind of like theory where you've got a set of teams. So you've got reps here, for example, like if it's depending on who you send your inbound records to, if it's account executives or SDRs to vet out a little bit more, um, we'd basically just do the same concept. You create a team and then we determine what rules should basically apply to when they should receive those records. So mm -hmm. if I go, for example, if I go to this, this is just like mirroring a Salesforce report or a list view. Pretty simple, straightforward. You're just pulling from any record and then any like field customer standard right here. Um, and then once you kind of like package that together, you can just reuse these rules and teams like in a rule set right here. So like here's one that we were working on a little bit recently, just like reassign qualified demos that don't book. So like this essentially is just going to look at different rules and then evaluate that to distribute to a team. And then like at the end of the day, it basically looks like you've got things like different objects or different like paths that they can take. And then 
if we go into these routers, we're going to basically trigger it off of um, sort of like what Tyler and Frank were talking about, where you've got a flow or a process builder where you're looking for a field update or some type of record trigger. Um, and then what, what we're evaluating here to determine who it should go to. So um, there's a lot of other like tiny details too. Like if, if you become a customer, we've got stuff to assign CS and account manager as well. Um, and then also just for like other account engagement, like for the intent signals I was talking about a little bit earlier. So um, mm -hmm. that's a quick, like short one-on-one, but there's a lot of like details behind that if you want to. Oh, I saw all those details on the rules of, of how you get those leads to the right place. I love that. But I think what is important for me at a high level, right, looking at this, hopefully from some of these people learning from you right now, this group is you got, you got to do the hard work to really get super detailed on how to route that lead, right? There's a ton of rules in there. And I actually love that it was like hard to understand because <laughs> it should be, right? Like, yeah, a lot of detail in the back. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of work to, to define all those things. And the only way you're going to do that is by working, you know, it probably takes a lot of time too, right? By working with the team and spending the time to get there. Um, oh, God, I just had something on the top of my mind that I wanted to ask. Just just to throw in there, you know, the, the key, I think one of the key observations about this is this: those are business rules. You know, as mm -hmm. operations people, we tend to think of it as, a you know, an operational exercise. But it's about business discovery first, and then, you know, the operational piece second. So, you know, that that's another another great, you know, contribution, I, you know, that we make. Yes, and I I like that you're calling attention to that, Frank. Especially for this community in general, we continue to hear from the members of of this function, right, and of the community itself that we want to be seen, and I think a lot of us do. We want to be seen as strategic leaders and, and able to make a, an impact to this to the overall strategy of the organization and maybe it's go to market plays um but you have to know how to ask those questions or or just learn or just ask right and and learn what else you need to ask um because what like what you're saying is is so true it's business process right it's a part of the business it's not just an operational tactic right when when you get the when you get the invitation you don't come to the table saying, tell me what you want to do. You say, tell me what you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I love that. Um, okay. That, what I also wanted to call attention to, I just remember now, I was blanking a moment ago, was I love that this idea of lead routing and, and I'd love for the audience, if you're still hanging on with us, I hope you are, to just say kind of yes or no to this, but are you using lead routing to uh, reassign leads back to like if they're dead, right? Or to have them route to someone other than a sales rep. It's not just about getting them to the sales teams. You could see in Scott's example, hey, we are actually routing records to, you know, if, a, if it's a current customer that fills out the form and that happens all the time, which is so crazy to me, <laughs> you know, we got to get them to the account team, right? Um, and so I, I think it's important to, to, you know, not think of it just as lead routing. <laughs> it's, it's just customer routing management, right? And making sure the requests get to the right people. We have way too many unengaged leads. <laughs> Lori says no. Okay. So it's good stuff to think about. Not really. <laughs> I think one of the, one of the things I'll point out, like all these questions coming in are great and and this is actually what um, got us to switch from having uh, one tool to another tool. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot that would come up often. Like we had a problem with um, BDRs contacting current customers and it was, you know, nobody wants that experience. The BDR doesn't want it. The customer doesn't want it. And the account executive who own or the CSM doesn't want it. So nobody likes this experience, right? So it was something that, we just, because it was very, very detailed logic that I had shared with this crew earlier that ours was in a Word doc, which is fine. Again, like I'm a big fan of Word doc to start, but then to get a request to get it changed in our routing tool was like a six week thing. And it with account shifting, it just wasn't scalable. So we had BDRs doing their job 
hitting their SLAs, following up with these leads that were customers. So, you know, they're trying to hit their SLA and then they end up wasting their time on a customer and making people mad. Um, so these are all questions that it's like, hey, is our tool that we're using right now to route leads a problem because we can't accomplish this? We have too many unmanaged leads just hanging out. We have customers being contacted. Is that a direct result of the tool we're using to route them and the resources we have to support that tool? And so one thing I'll mention is um, I did get a lot of pushback for changing the tool, which is a fair, but I started, we used uh, project management tool Trello. I'm sure you've all heard of it, but I started a lean data column and was like, anything we can't do because our tool doesn't do it, put it in the lean data column. And when that column was full, people started to listen. Like, <laughs> oh, maybe we need a new tool. So these are awesome questions and problems that we all have. So like, how can you, to your stakeholders in your company say, hey, this might be a problem we, we need to think about. And like Tyler was saying earlier, like how do you do it before you're in trouble? And these are all the questions that if you're asking now are awesome. So I can encourage you all to ask these to your teams right now and see mm -hmm. if it can be solved with what you're using or if you need to make the, make the switch. I love that, that's a good call out. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, I think I'm going to jump into a question that we had maybe slated for a different part of this, but it feels, feels appropriate to start talking about it. Now we've talked a little bit about partnership. We've talked about um, uh, the impact that lead routing can have and a system can have on, on the effects of compensation um, and marketers now more than ever, you know, it, we are part of the marketing org at large, right. In marketing and RevOps. Um, we're accountable to revenue. Um, and so, you know, Kimberly, we were talking a little bit about like, what does that mean as far as the role that we have in this sort of, uh, in, you know, infrastructure around lead routing and our accountability to revenue? Like, are our KPIs going to be measured against revenue? Um, you know, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on it and anybody else who wants to jump in too. Yeah, I think... Uh, I've definitely been a part of orgs where marketing is is held to revenue. And I think obviously we are, as marketers, we are all held to revenue, whether or not you're held to revenue, right? <laughs> but it benefits everybody if sales is getting good leads on time and um, to the right account and all that. So I think it's a really good point to bring up that operations wise, even if you don't own lead routing, how you impact lead routing because of the forums that you have, are you collecting the right data to route the leads to the right people? And can they follow up? Does it have all the information the BDR needs to follow up? If not, can you use enrichment? So as a marketer, how can you use your skills and your strengths to understand what will push better leads, higher quality leads, leads they can work faster to turn into revenue? So it's like taking a step back and making sure that your part is that part that you play helps them at the end, right? And I think the more you get involved in it, the more you understand exactly what goes into routing them at the right time to the right people. And from my perspective, I think showing revenue on the back end as it relates to lead routing is actually doable. Um, a lot of these tools have insight uh, reporting and analytics that you can show uh, time to route, time to action. You can show how many were disqualified by um, the tool itself versus a BDR having to waste their time on it. So these things play a role in revenue at the end of the day. And how can you show how that makes an impact? So yeah, it's a good point, Mike. I think it's really relevant to all the work that we're doing on the back end. Anybody else? Always, always, always good to benchmark, you know, before we started this process, here's where we were at with conversion statistics and all the other things. And, uh, you know, six months later, you run it again and you have a provable difference. And this makes, mm -hmm. uh, makes a point. And, you know, another, Another part of what you're doing to success, especially if you're very involved in, you know, in doing the mechanics of routing, is understand that you're actually yeah. taking on some sales enablement chores as well, because you're the one who's sending the sales alerts. So, you know, here's an example. Here's how you read the sales alerts. Here's where you find the leads because you've routed them. So you know where the, the views are in your CRM, like Salesforce, where they show up. For example, so you may wind up doing new new SDR training, you know, at least for a little bit, because you're the expert on how they're made visible and how they're communicated and how you kind of lead the read or, or read the lead 
as it gets into Salesforce, here's the fields you look at, here's where that data came from, for example. So, uh, you know, the partnership, you get, you really get uh, embedded, you know, uh, even in the sales enablement process, uh, the more that you take on responsibility for uh, routing. Mm -hmm. Tyler um, and Scott and or Scott, um, do either of you hold um, regular sort of trainings with, with, internal stakeholders on sales or anything like that about how to read the lead or, or what fields, you know, they should be looking at, or maybe even what fields they don't have access to that they should have access to now. I know I posted it at both of you and you're both like, <laughs> go for it. Tyler, and then I'll chime in yeah, after. I think um, when it comes to the routing process, I think that the router does a little bit of that reading itself. Like I saw that Scott was filtering out like Gmail email addresses, Yahoo email addresses. And I think that like that's an important step before even a, a person gets to it. And I think if you are using like mechanically, you're limited with how you're routing, routing the leads. You're sending a lot of that to someone to manually read where it could be automatically done and a lot of times like to Kimberly's point earlier if you're using an older tool and people are resistant to moving to a better one the rules are going to fit into that old tool it's going to fit like like I guarantee if you move to a, a better tool that can do more there's going to be a lot more rules that people want to see implemented like when we first implemented distro like a lot of stuff came out of the woodwork like oh we, maybe we can you know filter out these kind of email addresses, maybe we can send these to this group and these to that group. And like all these things that weren't mentioned before, but then suddenly you give people the keys to to do it. And like, yeah, you get all these rules out there. So I might not be working directly with the sales team on how to read some of the enrichment data that we might not be using in the router, but I think the router itself does a lot of that beforehand. And then the manual stuff that's a little bit more nuanced a human can handle. Mm -hmm. yeah I would, I would agree like if it comes down like to the like the enrichment data like in servicing it to the reps like we just try and like surface what's going to be i'd say for preliminary like outreach just what might be important like if they requested a demo and didn't book with us like here's some just short little info so they know like hey i'm not wasting my time on something that like is unqualified we can't sell them in any sense or form of them using our product. Like just so like their time spent on like obviously the best intentions for moving along sales cycles. Um, the train and enablement piece, I'd say most of that we just try and do that during um, like onboarding. So a lot of that just comes down to documentation we have inside of work ramp for the teams. Um, just so like they know, hey, here's here's the status, like here's what our like leading contact and account statuses mean and like when essentially it should kind of align to that, like sort of like what Kimberly was mentioning earlier, you don't want to be having reps work a bunch of customer accounts if that's not their assigned role, like as an install base rep. <laughs> For sure. So you just got to take note of that, have it documented and put it in your onboarding and internal knowledge management systems. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, um, I, like Frank's shirt says, <laughs> that shirt's really a hot topic today. Uh, it depends. And, and I think that um, what I've experienced around uh, just getting reps to pay attention to the data inside of the system uh, is largely about the role that they play and, and, and whether or not um, your org is selling to an audience that, uh, you know, I'd argue most of them are not okay with just getting like, uh, as, as someone I know says, pitch slapped. <laughs> so like, here, here's our pitch, buy from us. Uh, most of us are not okay with that. Uh, but, you know, getting them to look at the data that you're passing through on these records and say, hey, here's their click stream, right? Here's how they interacted with our site. And um, if they MQL'd and you routed that lead, that's a very different thing than someone raising their hand and saying, I want to talk to you. And so I think that training is important. Um, and we as marketing and revenue operations professionals have a very unique opportunity to continue driving the value of uh, the connections between these systems and the business rules that have been put in place and be seen as that thought leader and that strategic um, enabler uh, inside of the org to say, hey, pay attention to this. 
have a have a conversation about their journey that they went on. Don't just pitch slap them. <laughs> um, and so anyway, I feel like that's always a good one. All right, we're coming up towards the end. I definitely have other things that I could ask, but I do want to jump over since we were talking about sort of working in and around uh, relationships and agreements between sales. Jackson, uh, you asked this question, so I'm going to go ahead and throw that up on the screen, hear what people have to say about it. A lot of work goes into routing leads accurately. What do you do when sales is ignoring SLA requirements and not converting or following up? Um, I'm, I'm not going to pick on anyone who wants to go first. What do you do when they're ignoring the SLA requirements? We had a rule and an agreement, not just a rule, with sales that depending on what type of lead it was, like a hand raiser for sure, if the SLA wasn't met, let's say it's two hours, it, get, it got already round robin. So um, making sure that those leads are getting followed up on. We had similar rules across the board. So that's just one example. But yeah, it was definitely... Um, motivation for people to follow up right away because then you lose the lead and it ensured that leads got worked. Um, so they either had to be actioned with DQ'd or accepted by a sales rep. And if they weren't moved into that status, then they were re-round robin. I like that. That's a nice rule agreement. <laughs> and, and every, every org will answer this differently. I've, certainly worked in previous lives where shaming was um, the, the common thing. If it stayed open for a certain amount of time, you got an email saying, you know, you still have a lead. If you got a second notice, then it was, you know, CC to your manager, for example, as well. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that I like that, but, you know, the mechanics are there and many of the tools will actually kind of <clears throat> have that prepackaged into some of the things that you can select. Mm hmm I've seen that. I mean, I don't know that I'm a huge fan of it either, probably because I wouldn't like it done to me. <laughs> but yeah. but I guess it does, to some degree, hold you accountable. But, you know, maybe you could just show a dashboard or something. It's like it's yeah, a it, less aggressive it, than a CC. <laughs> and it kind of assumes bad behavior when it might be due to some other issue, you know, for example, being out sick days or something like that. So it was a little bit crude. So I, I mentioned it for that reason. I, like I said, I'm not sure that I like it, but mm -hmm. if it does come up, you have to make sure that you think of all the ramifications for something like that. Like that. Anybody else, Scott? Yeah, I think probably the only other thing I would add is just making sure you, like, you have some disposition for at least knowing why they're not following up, just to toss it back over to marketing. Like, for example, if it's like maybe you send in a lead and it's a student or just a blatant test lead that is never going to convert <laughs> have like, we have a unqualified status and an unqualified reason that basically pops up and we can just select that. So like we know right. the disposition of it, or if it's like maybe you chatted with them and it's not really the right time, you can again, have that disposition going. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause oftentimes there's going to be reasons why this, this thing isn't happening. And so you need that disposition that out to be able to pull them out of the, the flow. Right. Um, I think that's a, a, a pretty nice segue into um, this idea of like handling um, hot and warm leads differently. Um, are, are either of you, any of you, and, and I think maybe Scott, we can jump in with you since you were just sort of touching on it. Um, you know, you have the ability to disposition out, but are you rolling out the red carpet for prospects that are ready to buy? Um, is there sort of a different flow um, that you go through in any way? And and I think the one thing, and I'll, and I'll let you answer now right after this, the one thing that was called to my attention um, was the reason I wasn't like RevOps was that I didn't really know how to answer. Someone said, hey, are you really a RevOps professional? They posed this question to me. It's like, what do you do when a government lead comes into the system? as a marketing ops person, I was like, well, you know, like it's going to hit the lead routing queue and, and whatever, whatever. And, and the argument that was being made to me was that somebody that's in RevOps that has been more closely tied to sales knows that inevitably there's likely someone, there's usually like one, maybe two people that deal with government leads in enterprise organizations, right? Like it's a very unique situation. And so therefore there is no other routing system or enrichment thing that really needs to happen. <laughs> if it's a doc of email address, it's going straight to Jim or Jane or whoever that rep is. Right. And so 
um, that's a that's a red carpet, you know, workaround. I think that <laughs> that people implement. But I'd love to hear, you know, hot and warm leads. If there's anything you're doing differently for those, Scott. Sure. Um, I think to add on to what you mentioned there, like for the specialization, like for in verticals, like for us, we have people in about I think like thirty or thirty five countries. So for like the EMEA reps, we have like tried to like pair them up with like people who have like their native language, for example. Like we've got a we've got a French queue, and uh, there's a guy on our team who speaks like fluent French, and we've got another guy on our team who speaks fluent German and I think Spanish as well. So like tying it up with like their native language, um, we have seen that being helpful for us and, and to like surface that essentially it's just filtering for like saying hey if they're in france it goes this one person and we know that every single time so we just put him a little bit further up in the queue so when somebody submits like their info or if they're just like somebody checking out and it's some like high intent signal we want to like send to the rep to see if it's worth reaching out um we know that based on that rule we have set up it goes to that person um and then we we do have Another similar case where we've got a person on our team that, that typically like they'll explore different verticals just so we can make sure we're like nailing down messaging before like broadcasting that across the entire team. Um, so like, for example, we did education accounts. So like any like dot edu, and I'm trying to remember there's one other like domain, like or some, some type of um, domain for education accounts. So we just like did contains like the dot edu and so on that way you know, hey, it's going to this person who's trying to break into different industries for us. Um, otherwise, most of the like hotter leads, we just toss it straight to the AE team and we just have the, the SDRs um, like focus a lot on outbound. But if there's like intent signals that accounts are doing, we'll, we'll send them to the SDRs based on like certain filters and then they can use their judgment to follow up or not. Nice. Um... Kimberly, do you have any hot, warm routing rules? Yeah, I've been at a couple orgs, and it's interesting to hear what Scott had to say because it, you know, it was like markets they're trying to break into, and we've done it with like where we know our high quality leads come from. So it's funny to hear just different ways to look at it, and I love that. But we've done it based on we. Uh, I've had, been at orgs where the events, you know, when you could meet with people in real life those were really, really high quality leads always. And so it was like, how do we get these to the reps as soon as possible, you know, minimal, anything, just get them over. Um, so we had separate routing rules for trade shows. Um, so those were red carpet leads. It didn't even matter if it was a Gmail address. Like we ignored what we normally would do in our regular re lead routing rules because we were like, it doesn't matter. Let's get them followed up with. These are really good. And we paid a lot of money for that trade show. So it's Definitely very, again, like to Frank's point earlier, it's business, business rules. But at the end of the day, it's like business rules that lead to revenue. So it's, it's very different depending on. So yeah, that was, that was a big red carpet lead routing rule that we had. Yeah, I too uh, had that rule in place. I, I used to be the marketing ops and events manager at Mavenlink and uh, someone would come to the booth and it was actually so interesting and maybe for those of you who work with events teams you could ignore this or or take it and see if it works for you too but we we literally had a paper form that they would fill out it would be used for a raffle too but we would stand there and that i would act as a rep and i would ask all these questions and then they would tell me whether or not they were sort of in market so like how hot is this real is this lead really and then being the person that had to go put in all that data later i would separate them into piles and I would take the stack that was like the hot ones and I would literally just drop it on the SDR's desk <laughs> and I'd say, these are the hot ones go. It doesn't matter if they're, you know, not in the system yet. Like I'll, I'll enrich later. I promise. <laughs> that sounds like we're going backwards. with paper. <laughs> <laughs> It does sound like we're going backwards, but, but it was it, because of the experience that the rep was having, I and the reps were having with the people on the floor it sort of like kept them around a little bit longer. We were like, oh, we're filling this out because you're going to enter the raffle. And, you know, I don't know. So for what it's worth, you can try that tactic. It worked pretty well for us. Um, anybody else on handling hot, warm leads? Frank, anything? Oh, 
a little different, but we have like a couple partners that we work with. So we have different channels for people that are coming through a partner because there's a little bit of a different relationship. And uh, so we have like a couple AEs that are focused on those accounts that know the ins and outs of that partnership account. That way it's a consistent experience regardless. So that was uh, one that we've, we found pretty successful. I love it. I love it. Sorry. I was reading Arthur's comment telling me that it was mops in the eighties. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, when your boss asks you to do it that way, you just, you just do it. Um, all right. There's I another really... have to go find a, a scanner for business cards, you know, to get them into a spreadsheet so I can import them, you know, not too many years ago. So yeah. Yeah. I ended up uh, eventually changing it to a a not a cookie-less uh, HubSpot form so that every form that was filled out was a new record. <laughs> it wasn't over. By the way, you got to tell it to clear the cookies every time. Otherwise, it's going to update the record. Repeatedly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, hot tip for the day. All right. Um, so I wanted to share this question that came in from, from Cassie. Um, the... The interesting part about the, here, I'll just read it for everybody. So we're growing rapidly and hiring new sales members every month. It's been a huge time suck reassigning existing accounts in uh, our leadership fields. It should be going a little bit faster. Uh, we're using lean data and chili piper. So the actual transitioning is pretty fast. It's the planning who gets what and, and all of that that takes time. Um, how long is your planning process and any tips on how to use our time more efficiently to try to uh, adapt to the growth? is basically the question there. Frank, you've been okay. at a number of startups. You have any yeah, tips? Yeah, I would on love to hear. Kimber yeah. yeah, Frank, I would love to hear yours. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, you know, because um, this is this 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 is a tough one. Um, you know, to Kimberly's earlier point, uh, I think you're doing the right thing by using Lean Data and Chili Piper. Y you want the mechanisms for this to be more agile than your CRM itself as well. So, you know, the fact that you can isolate it for the CRM, all of that logic, you know, I have to say, you know, the, the, the best process is um, knowing the SDR manager or the sales manager, the kind of the leader really well and being on a Slack channel with him and being, you know, just in tune with what's happening. I, I don't know that um, I can tell you to, you know, use this particular feature of lean data for example, I would, I guess I would say if, if you come to the point where you need to push back, um, the one, the one conversation that I sometimes frequently have is, um, let's make sure that we're not adding complexity for the sake of complexity. Like how many times do you expect this particular circumstance to happen? Right. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it going to be three times a week or is it going to be 30 times a week? Right. Do we need to automate this? You know, can we keep this simple at a scale that is manageable? And it's very, you, you see this all the time with marketing people wanting additional data fields in forms or salespeople who want additional statuses for unqualified, for example. And, you know, six months later, you look and see, well, there is only ever a handful of things that, that you ever dealt with. So, you know, do, I, I think, be willing to challenge complexity a little bit and just say, let's focus on the, you know, the 80% case, right. And make sure that we're not trying to spend a lot of time on the 20% case. Mm -hmm. The old 80, 80, 20 rule. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's the classic 80, 20 rule. I love yeah. it. Uh, we are coming up on time, so I don't want to, I don't want to go over too much, but Kimberly, if you had anything to add, I'd be open yeah, to it. I'll give a quick tip just because I've been yeah. through it. And so I empathize. So, I had the same exact problem. What I ended up doing is asking for things to be structured in a way where if we were reassigning and doing new uh, routing pools and stuff, we did it uh, once every two weeks. And like, if you didn't make the cut, you had to be in the next one. I mean, it was a very structured, like any changes to pools come here and this is when I promise it. And then any changes to routing where I have to retest the graph is only quarterly. And I just boxed everything because it, you're right. The planning and all of that is, it takes a lot of time. So whatever days they have a rep starting, they have to have all the new rules to you and then you can promise it every two weeks. But like, absolutely no, not going in there every, you know, fourth hour, like Frank says 30 times a week to add a new rep. Like, nope, 
you miss the cutoff. Yeah. Sorry. See you next week. And you do have to be a little bit strict, but it, otherwise it is a, a big waste of your time. So. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. Um, IT teams to do this too, right? When you're onboarding new team members and they need equipment. Yeah, no, there's hiring boxes that happen in high growth companies and, and all the new employees start at one time and go through their onboarding and they all get their equipment because it's hard to manage. So I, I empathize with that situation. And yeah, I think time boxing it around sort of an SLA for like, hey, every two weeks we're going to do this thing. I think that makes sense. Well, um, thank you all who attended. Thank you, um, the four of you, for for sharing your thoughts on lead routing. And hopefully everybody here thought that it was valuable. Um, if you have any other questions, of course, join us in the community. Um, a lot of these folks are there, so you can ping them directly. You can ping me, give us your feedback. And if you have ideas for additional sessions um, or content that you want to learn from the community, let us know. We'd love to host more of these. And um, everybody, you have a great rest of your day. And I'm going to go take some medicine. <laughs> take care, everybody. Thanks.